don't get a chance to do this very <laughs> often. I'm Holly Kaziber. I'm a school nurse here at the high school. And I want to thank you all for coming. I know there are a lot of uh, competing activities for the evening. Um, before I introduce our esteemed panelists tonight, I just want to um, make a comment about uh, why we're doing this. And it is uh, not in response to a lot of the um, national news and the media news about um, concussions, uh, especially in the NFL. Um, but because uh, we're proactive, um, we have been using the Impact um, online concussion program here for about seven years. And one of our panelists, Mrs. Loeb, will be telling you more about that. But it is to, in hopes that um, what you learn here tonight will be some new information and that you will carry that um, out with you into your own lives and perhaps um, uh, disseminate correct information about what a concussion is and uh, what to do about it. Um, and um, therefore, um, our future generations will um, hopefully come through their academic and their athletic um, experiences here on the island with better understanding um, all around about concussions, how to prevent them, and what to do um, if they occur. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to first introduce our first speaker, and her name is Dr. Kathy O'Connor. She is a certified athletic trainer and a general surgeon who comes to us tonight from Southern Maine. And she's been in sports medicine for 36 years. She's a member of MCMI, which is the Maine Concussion Management Initiative, the Maine Principals Association Sports Medicine Committee, Committee excuse me, and the Maine Department of Education Advisory Group for the new concussion law um, that maybe some of you have read about that's now in effect, and that um, we at this high school have been responsive to with our protocols and policies, which you can find online on our athletic page. Um, following Dr. O'Connor will be Barbara Loke, who is a family nurse practitioner. Barbara has been a nurse practitioner in our school-based health center here at the high school since 2007, and just recently has taken the position of um, school nurse that she shares um, at Pematic um, in Southwest Harbor. And sh she will be talking a bit about our return um, to learn in the IMPACT program. We have Mr. Dan Vibert, our certified, nationally certified and licensed athletic trainer, who is here with us in his second year. We're delighted to have him. Um, Dan brings uh, a lot to our program in, in terms of prevention um, of injuries to our athletes, uh, as well as treatment and rehabilitation. And he is really the first line of care when an athlete gets hurt on the field. Very important part of our program. He'll be talking about impact and return to play for the athletes. Um, we then will hear from one of our uh, veteran teachers, Sheila McLaughlin. She's been with, here, uh, with us here uh, for eight years as a teacher and uh, went to high school here, during which time she played soccer and basketball. She suffered multiple concussions and she will be talking to you about her experience uh, living with post-concussive post syndrome. Dr. O'Connor? Okay, is the microphone on? Awesome. So the big thing about concussion is that we're trying to change the culture around it because it has to be a multidisciplinary thing. It's not just the school base. It's got to be the parents. It's got to be the students. It has to be the coaches. So you all have to get this information so you understand what we now know about concussions. Because when I started back in 1981-82, it is gone. All of that stuff that I learned in college and medical school has been thrown out completely. So the stuff that my generation learned doesn't apply. So we need to get the new information out there. And that's one of the goals for the main concussion management in ah, initiative is to get that information out. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to start with what is a concussion? Let me find the arrow here. Cool. And why do we care? You got one brain. You only get one. And once it gets messed up, it impacts every aspect of your life. It's not like you got two legs and two arms. Yeah, you got one spleen, but you can live without it. What happens to your brain influences everything that you do. If concussion is not managed correctly, you can end up with permanent issues that impact, again, what you do for the rest of your life. My favorite one are the parents who played football back in the 70s and 80s, grandpa, 60s and 50s. I got hit, my bell rung, and I'm fine. How do you know? You know? Are you going to be the one that gets Parkinson's syndrome at 45? Are you going to be the early Alzheimer's guy at 60? Are you going to have to retire when you're 50 because you can't function in your job anymore? We don't have that information, but do you really want to wait 30 years if you can do something now to prevent that for your kids? So, and it's not just sports. Kids fall down. They skateboard without helmets. They smack each other upside the head. Little kids fall off of stuff. People fall downstairs. They get in car accidents. They fall off their bikes not wearing a helmet. So it's not just organized sports. It's an everyday occurrence. So having the knowledge to recognize what's going on, you can intervene not in just the kids who are in an organized sport, but in anybody. One of the fastest growing groups for concussion is the elderly. They fall down, everybody focuses on the broken hip, and nobody's paying attention to the head. State law. It is now mandated that every single school in this state must have a concussion management program and that there's a whole team involved. It is not an option. It must be there so that we find these kids, intervene, and prevent the academic issues that they get if they're not cared for properly. So like I said, forget what you've heard about in the past. Forget what was in the ESPN magazine five years ago. Things have changed. There's ongoing research. There's really great stuff coming out of the Department of Defense working with veterans. That's where a lot of this is coming from. Some of it is relevant to kids, but a lot of it is from adults, and they're two different brains. There's immediate symptoms, but there's stuff that doesn't show up till the next day, sometimes the second day. So it's not, in a, you know, something happens right now, you're going to know it, and then go from there. You have to be vigilant about it. So what happens? Well, number one is you don't have to be knocked out. That's the old wives' tale. You're not, if you're not knocked out, you don't have a concussion. That is the, one of the least forms of injury that we see, where you're unconscious and then you wake up. I've had people completely knocked out wake up without a symptom in the world. They do their impact testing and their brain works fine. And I've had people bump their head against the door and be a mess for a month. Everybody's brain is totally different. It's a physiologic change that happens. It's not a damage that you can see on a CAT scan or an MRI. There may be a type of MRI in the future that will look at brain function. That's one of those studies that the DOD is doing and hopefully will have a result in two years. But right now there is no test to tell you the brain is not working. There are in research situations, but there aren't any in the state of Maine. So what happens is the brain gets shook up. I like the dog food can analogy. If you have that wet dog food and it kind of sloshes or cranberry sauce in the can, and you throw that as hard as you can against the wall, the stuff on the inside sloshes forward, hits that side of the can, and then rebounds back. So it's not just the forward, it's the back, and it sloshes back and forth. So you take your brain, which is a little bit of gelatinous, and you shake it really hard. And you've heard about shaken baby syndrome, right? And how messed up that, that can make a, a baby or a toddler. Same thing's happening in the brain. And depending on your age, that will influence how your brain responds to that chemically. There's no bleeding. There's no swelling. It's a chemical disturbance. And since our memories and our learning are all chemically encoded in our brain, again, depending on what side of your brain's all smushed, that will affect what problems you have. That's the fancy part of it. So, certain chemicals go 
up inside the cells, certain chemicals go down inside the cells. They flip. And until the body and the brain can pump that back across to make it the way it's supposed to be, the function isn't there. And what happens with an injury to the brain is that your brain is going, oh God, don't give me so much blood flow because I'm going to swell and I'll die. So it cuts down on the brain blood flow. So you need the blood flow to be better to fix this, but the brain has shut it down, so you have a mismatch. The thing that you need to clean up the mess, your, your body can't provide. It's getting the signal, don't do that, and your brain's going, but I want it. How long that takes to go back is how long the concussion lasts for. It can be two days, it can be two years. There is no set pattern. It is different for everybody. It is different for every age group. There is a difference between concussions. So if you have a 10-year-old who gets hit with the same amount of force, and you have a 15-year-old, their brain is going to respond differently because of the anatomy of their brain and the maturity of their brain. Our little brain cells are wires with insulation. As we get older, we get more insulation. But the younger we are, we've got gaps. It just hasn't all happened yet. We used to think the brain was fully mature at age 14. It was downhill from there. Now we know that's so not true. People can actually heal their brain from a stroke, even in their older ages. So that, again, old thinking, old research, gone. This is called a functional MRI. Again, it's a research protocol. This particular set of scans is from the University of Pittsburgh, the concussion center that they have there that is pretty much the leading center in this country. And literally, the Steelers practice field is attached to the building, and the MRI is like from here to there. So when somebody gets hurt, you can literally get them in the MRI like that. The NFL mandates a mobile MRI on the field at every stadium. It's somewhere in the bottom of the stadium within stretcher distance, okay? What that shows, you see those little white spots? Those are hyperactive parts of the brain. And that's after concussion, because those chemicals are messed up and it's trying to fix itself. And the blood flow isn't there. And that's the natural response to being shook up like that. What they found is by doing the impact test, literally in the tubing, I think I have a picture of that. They would take these kids, put them in the MRI, and they've got overhead a screen and a little keypad. And they did a modified impact test. And they found that the improvement in the scores went along with those hyperactive areas going back to normal. So we know that function goes along with improvement in the testing. Do we have this available so we can just you know, throw somebody in an MRI? No. Um, you can get this program, it's three quarters of a million dollars, and most hospitals don't want to do that. Um, and you have to have somebody who knows what they're looking at. So how long does it take to recover? Again, it's different based on age, how much the injury was, what their previous history is. So if you look here, 14, it's about 50% at two weeks for high school kids, two weeks. It's not the same for kids versus adults, college versus older adults. It's very different. So when kids unfortunately see the pro sports, oh, he came back in a week, they wanna know how come I can't? Because their brain isn't the same. It's a young brain. It's more plastic, literally. So it squishes more and the chemical recovery takes longer. And that's hard to explain. So what do we do? We can't throw them in an MRI to see how they are. You can only try and identify it, get them to understand what's going on. I tell kids, you're in the concussion bubble. You're in here, we're out here. We see the world as a reality. You're in the concussion bubble, and it's a little on the blurry side. And until your brain can see through that bubble, you don't have a real concept of what's going on. You know you want to get back to your sport you know you want to get back to music class. Somebody playing the drums has the worst time coming back from a concussion. 
Um, you want to get back to playing with your friends. You want to get back to doing your regular schoolwork because you love being in school. But until that healing process is complete, they're not going to be able to function properly. Changing things that we do in home, at school, their extracurricular activities, all of those affect recovery. Because again, the more stress we put on the brain, the harder it is for recovery. Does that make sense? Okay, it's, it's just like a muscle. If you keep overdoing a pulled groin muscle, you're gonna end up with permanent scarring, problems walking around, and you're not gonna be able to perform like you want to. So these are the things that you ask, how do you feel? And the younger the kid, the more creative you have to be with asking. Because little kids, when you say headache, they think, yeah, it hurts right here. They don't understand headache like we understand. It's a concept they don't really get till they're about 11, 12. Dizziness, you have to explain what dizziness is. Usually the under 12 group, you really have to, it feels like things are spinning. Well, do you mean up or down or side to side? You have to explain it more. And then what you ask about what they were like on the field. And a lot of times you have to ask bystanders, look at the film, ask the parents. That's why when somebody comes to my office, I'm like, were you with them? Did you see tape? Did somebody tell you what they were like if you weren't there at the game? Because that can tell you information that the student athlete cannot tell you because again, they're in the concussion bubble. Their perception is completely off. They may have amnesia. They may not be able to remember certain points. So you have to get that information because it gives you a better idea of how long it's going to take them to come back. And we, most of us use a post-concussion, sorry it's a little dark, symptom scale. So we go through, it's 20 of them, and we ask them to rate it. Zero is nothing, and six is the worst. So if you feel like your head's going to fall off, that's a six on the headache scale. If you're so dizzy you can't stand up, that's a six. And they end up with problems, not just you know, how they feel, but how they function. Can they remember? Are they rereading everything? Can they concentrate? Do they stare at you with the glassy eyes and it's going right over their head? Are they having problems with light or no noise sensitivity? These fluorescent lights aren't bugging us, but to somebody with a concussion, we don't notice the flicker, but our brain does. Our eyes take it in, the brain processes it. When you have a concussion, that process is so messed up, you feel like you're gonna throw up. Little noises, especially younger siblings. Just the tone of their voice puts an ice pick through your eyeballs. Um, being in school. School is like the worst environment for a concussed kid. It's loud. It echoes. It's fluorescent lights. You're constantly being stimulated on all sides. Walking down the hallway is a nightmare for these kids. And that's why we have the modifications to try and decrease that stimulation. Think of them, of, think of them as temporarily autistic. You gotta look for the little triggers that make them miserable. And they all overlap. All right, we have the cognitive, how can they think? Sleep, are they getting sleep? Or are they not getting sleep? Are they sleeping all the time? Mood, is it adolescent cranky or is it concussion cranky? And how they feel, the light noise sensitivity, the headaches feeling totally fatigued, like they just went out and ran around the track five times and they've just been sitting there in the office. <coughs> what are the risk factors? These we know by research. This is not stuff that's made up and it's hard for kids to understand this. If you've had more than one concussion, once you get one, you're at risk for another. If you don't fully recover because you lie about your symptoms, or your family does all the talking for you. That's always a fun one. Trying to get a 12 year old to actually speak up. Um, they've had a recovery, a couple months later they get another injury. It's lesser force. The brain is not a happy camper and you need to identify those kids. We do know that kids with learning disabilities of any kind doesn't have to be that they kept back a grade or they specifically have dyslexia but you have a kid who maybe has an individual education plan for reading, individual education plan for behavior issues. These kids that are already having maybe some functional problems with their brain, you then shake that puppy up 
and you've disturbed all of that compensation. A lot of kids with ADD who don't take meds, who you rely on sports to get that energy out and to help them focus, you take that away and they melt down. They cannot function. They can't read. All that compensation that they've built into their lives to, comp to make them be able to be functional in whatever environment is gone. Physical or cognitive stress. Okay, so we took them out of school, but at home, they still have to do chores. They still have to walk the dog. I had a kid who had to walk two miles up the side of a hill to get to his grandmother's house because that's where he had to go after school. We couldn't figure out why he wasn't getting better. Well, we're not letting him do athletics. He's kind of hanging out at school, but then he's got to walk. We didn't know it. Do you want these kids driving? Oh, good God, no. They're brain injured. Do you want them babysitting smaller children and making possibly critical decisions? We shouldn't be putting them in that situation. We have to wait till they're healed. So it has to be a stepwise process, introducing those stressors as they get better. So this is what happens when they try and do it all and suck it up and go through it. They wake up, they didn't sleep well. They get to class, it's a disaster. They feel worse. The environment makes it worse. They finally get through the day. They go home. They're trying to do the homework because now they're behind. They've got all this stuff to make up. And they go to bed feeling worse than when they get up. And then when they get up, it all starts over again. The big thing, you know, you get those little headbands for soccer and you get the little sensors to put in helmets for different sports. We don't know how much force causes brain injury. It's different for every individual. You can't say there's a cutoff of whatever, G-forces. Above that, we need to check you to make sure you don't have a concussion. Because we know that subconcussive, smaller but more frequent blows can be just as damaging and cause as many problems as the one big hit. There is genetics involved. There's a gene called APOE2. There's a certain family who had NHL players um, where pretty much all of them have had to retire. And that was the common thing. But it's not like you can go out and get that screening at your doctor's office. Um, the repetitive injuries we talked about. When we talk about force vectors, everybody thinks football, head to head. What about hockey? They're spinning on the ice. They're sliding into things. Soccer. You're running forward, you don't see that blind side coming that then twists your brain this way. So there's, there's no way to prevent that rotation. It's multi-directional. Just like in a car accident, you get hit from behind and your car spins. So it's not only forward, it's around. Equipment. There is no equipment to prevent concussion. Does not exist. So anything that makes that claim that it will prevent concussion is lying the fancy mouth guards that cost 40 bucks, the $500 football helmets, doesn't do it. Yes, in some situations it's been shown compared to a different kind of helmet, but prevent, no. The silly headbands for soccer, useless. There's nothing in a hockey or lacrosse helmet to prevent anything. Those are to com com protect your skull from being fractured. The mouth guards are to keep you from having to go and spend thousands of dollars at the dentist. Can it decrease the amount of force? Maybe. Jury's out on that. And we know, and it's always fun to be able to show people this in the office, depending on where you smack your head, will tell me what kind of symptoms. So if you fall and hit the back of your head on the ground a couple of times, and your kid comes in, problem seeing, can't read, and is crying every time you talk to them because the back of your head processes all the visual information. But when things sloshed forward from that force, the front of your brain squished against the inside of your skull. This is the emotional part. And that's why they're all cranky and weird on you. They cry at dog food commercials. Somebody says no and ah! Drama, drama. <laughs> so it, it's good to be able to show people once we get the symptoms squared away, this is why, and it seems to click. But until they understand it, they're just not going to get the program. So, trying to get some scientific evaluation, because that's what it used to be. 
we would sit there and go, okay, how many fingers? Do you know who the president is? Not a whole lot of science. And that's where the impact testing comes in. Okay. So we're gonna do questions at the end. So if you got them, write them down so you don't forget, because you never know how many concussions you've had. <laughs> okay? And we'll keep going. There we go. If you want to stick that in your lapel. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Okay, so I'm Barbara Logue and I work here at um, MDI High School in the School-Based Health Center. And like Holly said, we've been doing this for seven years. It was a, been a steep learning curve our first year or two where it's pretty rocky because we were trying to understand more about concussions ourselves and the impact test and you know, getting the coaches, the players, everyone on board. But we've come a long way in seven years. <laughs> um, and one thing that Dr. O'Connor just said like about the bubble is I've had kids say before, not that it's like a bubble, but all of a sudden just one day something leaves them and they feel back to themselves. And, and now I'm gonna use that analogy of the bubble because that's kind of what that sounds like to me. Being a um, solo. Right. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. So here at MDI High School, I see you know, the athletes like Dan or Holly you know, will refer them to me or they can certainly see their own provider anywhere on the island, but I'm here on Tuesdays and I'm happy to see concussion kids and and I honestly really love it. I think that's a favorite thing that I do as a nurse practitioner. Um, and one thing, the most important, one thing I've really learned is that every concussion is different. And so every situation is unique. The managing of the kid is, is unique every time. Um, let's see, and oh, um, well, I'll talk about the you may, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in a minute, but I've done, a, over these years, done a lot of different trainings, like the impact. People have a different webinars, and then every year there's a great sports concussion conference in Boston that I go to, and they have like Dr. Cantu and all the real um, concussion researchers at. If, I mean, if you guys are ever interested in going and learning more about concussions, it's a great, um, a great one to go to. So I'm gonna talk, talking about clinic visits, like if they come to see me here at school or if they see you know, their provider, what most likely it'll be like. A little bit about the impact test and then also return to learn here at MDI. Okay, so if they come in to see me, first of all, what we do is I want a real history of the event that caused a concussion. Like if it was football, was it helmet to helmet? Did they have a fall? Uh, if it was soccer, did they you know, slam heads with someone or did they um, you know, hit the ground or um, get kneed in the head, something like that. How did they, how did they, what happened to cause them to have some symptoms? Um, and then I go into the health history. And like Dr. Connors talked about, like previous concussions can really impact, um, you know, their recovery from this concussion. Learning disabilities, migraines, sleeping problems, depression can all impact on um, their recovery. And um, then I do the symptom checklist, again, similar to what Dr. O'Connor did. I think that's pretty standard and have the kids grade it. And then as they come to see me week to week, I just go over that again. And that just gives us something to go by every week to say, oh, your headache last week was a six, but this week it's a four, your dizziness is down to a two or whatever it is. Um, okay, and then I do a little neurological exam. Um, and so like I'll, I'll like check their vision, do cranial nerves, visual fields, um, you know, do they know the date and the time, do they remember what happened when they, had their, when they got their concussion, the, you know, who they were playing, what the score was, did they win, that sort of thing. Sometimes I'll ask them, uh, do they know who the president and vice president is? They usually know the president, no one ever knows Joe Biden's the vice president, I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, I'll have them like count down by sevens from 100, you know, sort of stress their brain a little bit. Um, you know, spell the word world backwards, do the months of the year backwards. You know, but sometimes, especially the kids with the learning disabilities, they'll say, oh, geez, I could never do that normally. So I'll just make a note of that. You know, some kids just aren't really capable of doing that sort of stuff. Um, then I'll do like a little balance test, you know, like have them stand on one foot, close their eyes, you know, see how they can tolerate that. Lots of times they just sort of almost go over sideways, have them try to do a duck walk. And again, I've had kids just sort of wobble around trying to do those things. Then I do what's called like vestibular ocular testing. And like I'll have them like follow my finger with their eyes without moving their head. And does that give them any symptoms? You know, like dizziness, headache, nausea. Sometimes I'll just say, oh, my eyes hurt or, you know, I'm going to throw up, you know, something like that. Um, put my fingers like this. And again, have, their, have them look back and forth between my fingers like this 
or like that. And again, does that bring on any symptoms? Then I'll have them kind of hold their thumb out like this and just move their head side to side. And again, often kids are like, ugh, I just can't tolerate that or looking up and down. But you can imagine if someone's feeling sick or dizzy looking up and down like this. Imagine if they're trying to do work, like a computer looking at a screen typing. So you can see how it can impact them at school with their symptoms. Um, and then I'll have them stand up and kind of go like this and see if they can do that motion and see you know, how that impacts them. So that just gives, us, gives me an idea of how they're doing um, neurologically. Okay, and once I have all that information, you know, the, the history, um, their little neuro, neuro exam, then we'll look at their impact report. Often Holly or Dan have had them already do it. If it's a non-athlete, you know, I can take them into the conference room and do the impact test right on them there. So impact is immediate post-concussion assessment and cognitive testing. And it was developed by these team of researchers at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center um, in 2007 when I started. And, and they were like, oh, are you going to be able to return kids to play? And I'm like, hmm, I don't really know how to do that. What, am I, what, what do I do? And so I was researching about concussions and learned about the impact program and actually went out there for two days and had a training. And it is an amazing setup out there to see the, where the Pittsburgh Steelers train and everything. And also um, Dr. Collins is from Maine. He's from Hamden and he played baseball at USM. And he's a really great guy, and I've enjoyed, you know, meeting him at different meetings and things. And he always likes seeing Mainers. <laughs> okay, so the impact test. Um, and, it's, and you can see that, I'm not going to read this all the way through, but you can see like this used like all over the world, basically, in high schools, colleges. They're, I don't think the pediatric one is out yet. They're still, I think, working on that, but, you know, for younger kids, too. But it's been, you know, done on hundreds of thousands of kids and adults. <coughs> And it's basically a battery of tests of memory, reaction time, processing speed. Um, if any of your kids have done it, you've probably heard them complain about it. <laughs> if anyone's interested after, I, there is a little demo link I can give you if you want to try it at home. It, uh, just a little 10 minute version of it. But, um, but it gives you an idea of, of what the test is like and how hard it might be if you have a concussion. Okay, so the first part of the test is just demographics like height, weight, gender, you know, that sort of thing. If you've had speech therapy, any learning disabilities, a little bit about your history. And then your current sport, like you're on varsity um, football, you're on JV or, you know, stuff like that. And the next part, um, oh, it's just more like about the concussion history. Uh, and then again, more about the history, like treatment for migraines and things like that. And then here again is that same symptom scale and the same one that I use in the clinic and, and you can see how that's graded. You'd be surprised how many of them tell you no and then confess to the computer. <laughs> yes, yes, that's very true. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, then there's like six different modules and they check um, different things like the first module is word discrimination. So it gives you a list of words and then it has uh, it's like um, 12 target words and then it'll, it'll show you the list then some other words will come in and you say was small one of the words yes or no. Um, so it's a memory test and then also at the end of the test these words come back to see if you can remember what the words were. Module two is design memory. Similar to the words but it's a design. This one's tricky because it's the same designs that come back but they're rotated a bit. So you have to remember if it was the exact design or not. The next test, um, this grid of like X's and O's comes up and, and they highlight just three of the X and O's and, and then you're like, oh, where, what was that? And then in between you have to do this red and blue speed test and then the grid comes up and you have to remember which of the X and O's were highlighted. That one's pretty tough. <laughs> um, and then the, the next one is symbol match. So there's nine different symbols and then um, they come back without the number and you have to say like was number eight a square? You know, was it a square? Yes or no? And I think of all the tests, that's the one I have the hardest time with when I do, when I do the test, trying to remember which number goes with which shape. Number five is color match. And so they just have to click, like if red is written in red, they click it. But if it's red is written in blue, then you don't. And again, kind of a speed test. Um, and module six um, is, uh, I think that's, OK. Um, Oh, okay, so that has like, there's this thing like three letters like C-A-T. You'll see those three letters and then they go away. And then you have to, there's a distractor test, 25, 24, 23, 22, to try to count that down as fast as you can. And then the next thing comes up, what were those three letters? So again, memory plus speed on that one. 
Okay. And then at the end, it, you get a big report. I couldn't get a whole report to print up, but I've got several copies here of some kids I've seen this year. Um, and if, if anyone wants to look at it closer, it's a pretty in-depth report. So I'm happy to look if you guys want to look at those. And the important thing about impact is that it, you know, it's not meant to stand alone. It's not like you do the impact test and they don't need to see me or Dr. O'Connor or Dan. You know, it's meant to be a tool to help in recovery. And, and it really helps, I think, kids to see, oh my gosh, there is something wrong with me. If it's an A student and they're in like the first percentile on uh, their visual memory or something, it really helps the kids and parents to see that. Um, so it helps us to manage a concussion. It helps to really good for communication. Okay, then I'm just going to talk a bit about um, the return to learn, like how we do that here at MDI High School. And mainly communication is a key, you know, between Dan, Holly, me, the teachers, as soon as someone has a concussion, we, you know, talk with whoever their guidance counselor is, and then the guidance counselor will put the word out, and Holly too will put the word out to the different teachers. And we've come up, I think it was um, based on, I think, Cape Elizabeth High School's kind of return to learn thing is how we're doing it, like different stages. And the goal main is just to help the kids to participate in school, but without prolonging their injury, like making things worse. Um, and the symptoms that can really impact the classroom are like the mental fogginess, feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating, focusing, fatigue, headaches. Again, the light and noise sensitivity. I've had a lot of kids complain about that. Um, okay, so they progress through the six stages. Uh, and again, it's an individualized plan. Like I said earlier, every kid is different. So it's not a cookie cutter thing at all. But in general, we tend to recommend, recommend, recommend that kids stay home and rest for a couple days. If they can shut it down physically and cognitively, it gives out those chemicals that Dr. O'Connor was talking about, time to kind of get back to the kid's norm. Um, that's really helpful. That's, I think, hard because a lot of kids, boom, they're right there back at school the next day and then they feel terrible and they have to get sent home. So it's really, it's really best to stay home for a couple days if you can. And during that time, you know, they're excused from reading, their computer work. Um, a big thing is trying to get kids not to do video games and texting and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the hardest thing to get them to stay off of. And then as they're feeling a little bit better, um, they can come for half days. And if they feel better in the morning, they can come for that part of the day and then go home. Or if they're, or if they're exhausted, they can sleep in and come for the second half of the day. And sometimes we'll pick, you know, have them do like their essential classes, but not like their electives. And definitely no like PE class during that time. And then, you know, so over time they progress to full days with accommodations. And that can be like postponement of tests, assignments. Obviously like, uh, I just saw like SATs, we've had kids have to not um, take their SAT that was scheduled. Um, doing smaller assignments. They could wear sunglasses if they needed, if the fluorescent lights or whatever were bothering. Um, they can leave class early if walking in the hallway. Sometimes that stimulation of all the people in the hall or in the cafeteria really bothers them and they can leave class early. Um, one thing we really find helpful here is just having the kids rest in the, in the nurse's office for 15 minutes or a half hour. It's amazing how much better they feel after having a, a little break. Um, and then eventually they progress to full days without accommodations and then full days and in extracurricular involvement. Um, I also like the concept of small bites, and that sort of encourages them if they're doing their homework, to, like say algebra, do like a couple of problems. If you tolerate that well, maybe do a couple more. But if you start to do your algebra and you're, ooh, you feel terrible, back off from algebra. But maybe if you try to do a little bit of your reading, you can tolerate that and it doesn't bother you. So just doing little, little bites at a time. Um, let's see. Oh, and if, if they do have prolonged symptoms, then we can do like an individualized um, health plan or a 504 if it, if it comes to that. We have had several kids in the past who've had, I think, post-concussion syndrome. It's been like months sometimes with some of them getting back. Um, so once there are no symptoms at rest um, and are back to school without accommodations uh, and their impacts at their baseline, then they can start their return to play for sports which Dan's going to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, whoops. There we go. All right, so the uh, <clears throat> return to play protocol 
is basically it's a step-by-step -step process where we're gradually reintroducing the athlete to uh, exercise and physical activity because ideally they should be, have been home resting and not playing club soccer or at the Y playing basketball. So this is their first chance that they're now getting back into exercise. Uh, there's six steps, but for the purposes of this segment, we're just going to deal with the middle four, which are the exertional step days. Um, during and after each test, the student is monitored for any signs or symptoms of concussions, like we heard earlier, the dizziness, the headaches, the ringing in the ears, um, blurry, double vision, all that stuff he's monitored for, he or she. Um, and then after the test, we run through some cognitive and balance stuff, like uh, Bar was talking about. We'll do the hands on the hips. I'll give some numbers, have them repeat it to me backwards, you know, 613, and they would say 316, all that stuff. And we're looking for irregularities there. Um, you know, these kids, 15, 16 year old athletes, should be able to stand and close their eyes and hold that for 15 seconds with very few, you know, this. If they're constantly putting their foot down, that's an irregularity. Uh, so the six steps. The first step is complete rest and a return to baseline, uh, you know, like she talked about. Second step is part one of the exertional testing is just um, it's non-impact aerobic. So we're going to get them on the bike just pedaling. And depending on their fitness level, we'll go anywhere from 130 to 150 beats per minute for their heart rate and just hold it there for 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And again, we're checking any symptoms, any signs, have them do all the balance stuff, the cognition stuff. <coughs> um, most people do well with day one. Day two is the day where if I've had someone trip up, if you will, it's day two. Day two is um, we're adding movement. So now we get them on the treadmill or we'll get them running, side shuffling. We're getting that head moving a little bit, but we're still doing the cardio. And like I say, the, of the people who have failed, if you will, the balance stuff and the cognitive stuff, it's on day two. Day three is more sports specific, so we're gonna really get the heart rate up, get them doing backpedaling. Um, I'll have them do burpees, which is where they're jumping and kicking their legs back, really get them moving around, get the heart rate up. Um, basically anything I can think of that'll replicate their particular sport. You know, just jumping if it's a volleyball player. Um, and again, afterwards we're checking headaches, signs, symptoms, stuff like that. And if they progress through all that, uh, step five is full practice. You know, they go to practice, kind of keep an eye on them. And again, we're checking afterwards any signs, symptoms. And then step six is full clearance back into play. So it's a step-by-step -step thing where we're constantly monitoring them and, you know, they move on if they do well with the previous step. If there is any irregularities, any headaches show up on day two or balance problems on day two, which is when it usually is, we'll stop them and we give them 24 hours where they're symptom free. So if you know, we're doing it at five o'clock and they have headaches till eight o'clock, we probably won't do it until two days later because we want to let them be symptom free for 24 hours. And then we'll drop back to level one and kind of start over again. Uh, so that's the, that's the return to play protocol. Um, I didn't have any, any slides to do. So um, kind of what I've found, like I say, day two is the day where they, most people, where we're adding the movement, that's where they're going to trip up. And we're sitting at about 16 days is kind of our average where they're getting back. That's what the normal person's taking. We get some that come back in nine, and, but we have some that take 27, 30 days. But I found that the average is about 16, 17 days. Uh, so that's about it. Let's see, so I guess, can I hold this? Yeah? yeah that should work. Yeah. So um, let's see, I, I'm a teacher here now. I teach social studies here at the high school. I've been here for eight years. I started teaching in 2001 um, in Boston, and so I've been here since 2006. Uh, I went to high school here, which is always fun to be back in your alma mater. 
Uh, and I have definitely got all of those post-concussive <laughs> symptoms. It's so funny because I had been asked to speak, but I didn't actually know to what extent I might have. And then I look and I'm like, oh yeah, I have all those. Which is good and, you know, it's just good to recognize what you have and to work from that, which is fine. Uh, I played pretty actively soccer for my whole life um, until I blew up my knee. And then watching that, I'm going, oh gosh, I think I, by, by blowing out my knee, I probably saved my brain, which is good, I guess. <laughs> we get there. So I, um, I started playing soccer at age five. My dad played ball, like division one soccer and basketball. And so I started really young playing and played um, pretty aggressively. I loved playing on the boys teams. I loved actually playing on the boys teams because the referees wouldn't call the plays. They'd actually let it go. If um, you played with the girls, the refs always called. If you like slide tackled someone, even if you got the ball, they'd always call it. <laughs> so it would drive me crazy. So I always liked playing with the boys and it was always much more aggressive and it was fun and it was, um, it was good play. And I loved heading. Heading was my thing. It was, I was taller than a lot of the kids. I was taller than a lot of the boys for a long time because the boys kind of hit their little growth spurts by high school. And so I played on the boys teams all through grammar school. And, um, and at a bigger school, I was in Ohio when I was growing up and I moved here in the eighth grade. So um, it was fun. You know, I could always, I had a lot of height. I could get the ball. I love slide tackling and I was fast. So I many times would get the ball and I'd get kicked instead of them kicking the ball, they'd kick me. So I've had a lot of hits and probably by freshman year, I um, got knocked out, out on the field out there. And I went up and I got the ball and the other girl got my head. So she got my chin and knocked me out. And I didn't realize how long I was out, but I guess I was out for a little while. Um, and I did keep playing because that's what you did. It was the 90s and you just kept playing. So I played out the rest of the game. I think that eventually they had to take me off the field because I couldn't really figure out who I was talking to at times. So they had to take me off the field. And I eventually went back in and I played all through high school. And I got knocked out again. So, but I like to head. So it goes back to, you know, like it's that consistent heading. And so um, throughout high school, I slept slept through most of my classes here. I had Mr. DeCordy, who's <laughs> still here, and I definitely slept in a lot of his classes. Um, and the teachers were great. They were actually incredibly accommodating, and they still are, but I, um, I would sleep in class, and then I'd sleep through the test, and I'd wake up, and I'd stay after school, and I'd finish the test. So you'd get that half an hour nap, and it was great. You know, I'd, I'd be re-energized, and I was able to finish up the test. Um, and teachers did that for me all the time. So because, I don't know if that's enabling or not, but because <laughs> they were helping me and giving me all those supports, I never really addressed the issues at hand. So then comes college and people don't know you and it's not a small school. So I got to college and I was still heading a lot and I was still slide tackling a lot and I was playing pretty aggressive. And so I was playing division one ball at Providence College in Rhode Island and um, the professors were um, kind of didn't understand what was going on because I could do a lot of the things but I'd fall asleep during the exams and so I'd be really involved in discussion and I'd stand during class so I didn't fall asleep and I'd walk around so I did a lot of things to kind of keep myself engaged um, but I'd always fall asleep during the test and they'd, you know I'd fail every test and so finally the professors would say okay you need to actually see someone <laughs> and go to special services so they um, brought me in and uh, just let me do extra time on tests which was great uh, so I never had any formal I mean this is before all the concussion stuff so I never had any formal training or you know assessment but eventually because this kept going by the end of freshman year um, I had testing done and so they actually tested me and I qualified or was diagnosed with narcolepsy 
which is kind of an odd thing to be diagnosed with, but I always slept in classes and I kind of have this little history of sleeping, but I've been hit in the head a million times, so <laughs> maybe that had something to do with it. So, because um, I hit my REM cycle within like six minutes. Does that make sense? That's fast. That's pretty fast, right? <laughs> I always forget if I have the wrong number in there. So, um, by the end of freshman year, I had blown out my knee and by the end of my sophomore fall season, I wanted to get back on the field and ended up blowing out my knee again. By junior year, I blew it out again. So I blew it out three times, which was probably pretty good because I got a little rest on my brain. By senior year, I was back on the field. And by then, they had, you know, I was pretty, I'm not that good when you blow your knee three times. That didn't really help. So I wasn't on the field that much. Um, but by that four years, I really spent a lot of time sleeping in classes, making up the time afterwards, um, and I started teaching. So I graduated, I started teaching at 22, and I had about a 40-minute commute in Boston, kind of going through the big dig, which was happening at the time, which is really hard when you have a hard time staying awake. And it's a lot of stop and go traffic, and I'd actually have a parking lot that I'd pull into, because that would be where I'd sleep fall asleep for a good 20 minutes, half an hour, get back in the car and go. So I had my pit stop on the way home from work every day. And originally, you know, like you think it's narcolepsy because, well, that's kind of weird, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or different, different. Um, but uh, I don't do that anymore. And it goes back to kind of letting your brain rest. And so I don't I only live five minutes away, but I don't need to actually pull over <laughs> anymore <laughs> on my way to school. I don't sleep all day long. In fact, I probably don't get any sleep because I got two little kids and they don't sleep all night long. So I don't actually sleep to any of the extent that I once did. Um, my friends from college still ask and they're like, so how's it going? Like, are you able to survive? I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, you sleep all the time. And I always forget, because that's how they knew me. They didn't know me any other way, but always sleeping. Um, and I still suffer from migraines, and I still suffer from trying to process. It takes me forever to grade stuff. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but I, it does get done, and it happens, and it's fine. It's just that, you know, you accommodate. But it's nice to know that everything's being done to address concussions at this point. All right, so mm -hmm. there you go. Questions, so, I think? In general, if you um, like to ask any of the panelists questions, we have plenty of time. So um, go for it. Um, what's the volume? Do you keep records? Like, how are we talking about four year, four year? Did we have, have like 50? About 50 last year, I think. As far as operations uh, yeah. are concerned, we had. We had 30-ish. Yeah. Just the high school, right? Yep. This is not any of the middle school. We, you have already had 10 this oh. year. Yeah. We have uh, two who have recovered and eight who are still under care. And I have to uh, say that um, some are reported by um, know Dan and through athletics but um, students are better about self-reporting now they'll come in and say you know I walked into the um, fire alarm or I bent down to get something that fell out of the freezer when I stood up I hit my head on the freezer door and it had I had a headache so there's there there's some education going on and the words out there and I get I do get students one kid, you know, I think they were on a bus trip or something, and a, and a laptop fell out and banged him in the head. I mean, you wouldn't think that would really, but the kid had all the symptoms and you know, went through the whole protocol with that kid. Yeah, so it's a weird thing sometimes that you wouldn't think would cause a concussion, but it said do. And that's what reinforces yeah. the, the concept that it's not the same for everybody. So trying to find something to prevent or some kind of monitor to trigger you to check somebody is not going to work because what may give her a concussion may not phase me in the least. And there's no way to tell what that is. There's no test to say where your level is. 
in connection with prevention and how important it is, I'm just wondering if you'd have your high school child play athletics. If it, it depends on the sport, it depends on the skill level, it depends on the coach. Um, we have down in Southern Maine um, a particular peewee team whose coach is extremely aggressive, who seems to think it's Friday night lights all the time, and does drills that are not appropriate, and the parents are not calling him out on it, um, but the school nurses are. So that's why it has to be monitored. We, we as parents, adults, need to be proactive, not just for our kids, but for the other kids that are on the team that may not have a parent there to advocate, to speak up and say no. This is not appropriate. I don't want my child doing this. The other flip side is you have to call out the kids on bad sportsmanship and bad behavior on the field. The chip shot to the guy who tripped you and you whack him upside the head, the tripping in hockey. Um, field hockey is doing these things. It's, it's crazy. Um, the retaliation that can go on that the refs just don't see. The coaches may not see, but if it's your kid or maybe your neighbor's kid, you gotta call them out on it. And I've done it on the bench in college sports. I'll go up to a kid that I do not ever want to see that again. That's just, that's not how you play. Somebody's going to get hurt. Like one of my kids in eighth grade had a, got a concussion in AFL, in the Acadian Football League, and I think he took maybe like a month or so to recover, and then his, but he was healed, he could have played when he came up here, but he's like, I, he said, it was his choice, but he didn't want to, he said he didn't want to feel like that again. But I would, but <coughs> even as a parent and a concussion person, I would have let him play again if he wanted. Is that because you don't think there would have been lasting harm or because the yep. benefit to the kid outweighs the potential harm or what? Yep. It, well, but, well, my understanding is that if it heals, even though there is resource that if you've had one before, it might, it might be easier for you to get it in a second one. Right. But if your brain's healed, you should be okay to keep playing, you know, once you've gone through everything. You're not likely to end up with Parkinson's more so than you would have otherwise but based the on the problem is shot. we haven't had the research long enough. Right. You know, if you get hurt as a 12-year-old, we got to wait until you're 45, 50, 60. Yeah, so you don't like know. The, exactly. It's yeah. like the breast cancer research. we got to wait till everybody gets 30 years out to see what the survival rate is by using a certain drug. The same thing with concussion. But now that we're collecting this data and there's formal studies going on, and it's a time-intensive and not inexpensive process. That's part of the problem. That's why so much of it's being done by the Department of Defense. You know, they're willing to pay for it because they need to be able to identify these folks in the military. And like Dr. McKee is, is from the U, and she does a lot with that um, that uh, traumatic encephalopathy. You probably read about with the NFL players, but in her research, that she has seen some of the changes, you know, in the brains of like teens who died from other reasons and their brain was donated, but you know, the similar changes that they are seeing in those NFL players with that chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So it's all research. We don't know how much is too much damage. Yeah. I'd let my kid play. Do you regret playing? No. Mm -hmm. I definitely play. I'm, and I'd let my kids play. Mm -hmm. My little boy has cochlear implants, <laughs> so he has. I don't know if I'll let him play football. <laughs> <laughs> that might not happen. And we're, we're still debating. Maybe he'll just do cross country. But um, I, I definitely let my kids play. At what point is it appropriate if, if like, your child's been seen by a trainer or a coach that's gone through the training or such, and they're dizzy, these symptoms, do you feel like it's appropriate that if these symptoms and you have them stay home from school and rest and so forth, at what point or where is the line of, okay, they need to go to the ER or be referred for an MRI or like, how do you know the line of like, he needs to be seen by a medical, like a doctor? Right. If they have what we call focal symptoms, they complain of numbness or tingling. The vision is off in one eye. You notice their pupils are uneven. They're slurring their speech. They're getting sleepy and they're, they're not acting appropriately. Um, they keep repeating themselves. That's always a fun one on an away game with a bus. Who won? Five minutes later, who won? Those kinds of things that are what we call focal changes show us that there may be something going on bleeding on the brain. That you can see on CAT scan. And those, when, when they go through the process in the ER, the protocols, if they see X, Y, Z, that person, regardless of age, automatically gets a CT of the head. 
Um, but the generalized stuff, CAT scan and MRI are not going to show you anything. And that's the thing. Radiation from CT scan is not a small amount. It's very real, and the risk of later on having problems with tumors is very real, and it's something that they look at all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is just curiosity. That MRI in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. is that an fMRI or is that just a regular MRI? It's an fMRI. It is. With a specific program written only for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, the, the Department of Defense, um, I was at the, the impact thing the summer before last, and they had just finished year one. And it was pretty impressive, the first year's data. Mm -hmm. um, it's a three year grant that they have. So it takes them three years to do it. It'll take them another year or two to analyze all the data. And then I think it's a five-year follow-up on those people to see what happens over time. Um, and again, it's very technical. I mean, those programs cost tens of thousands of dollars to develop. And then you have to teach the radiologists how to read it. Yep. So you know, it's, it's going to be a process. And the thing is, it's being done in adults. And we know the adult brain is not the same functionally as, as an adolescent. So they're going to probably, once they get the protocol, then they'll expand it to include adolescents. Yeah. In your school district, what is your requirement for athletes compared to the impact test, referring to the impact test? What do you mean? Do you have in all your classes, all your students take it as athletics? It's very individualized for each school. <coughs> so I, I work with Freiburg Academy in reading their, their um, stuff. I help Wells and Sanford with both reading and recommending different things for accommodations. Each school set up their own protocol. Um, for Sanford, every kid that's involved in a sport gets a baseline test. Because if you don't have, especially for the kids with learning disabilities or ADD, which really affects where they're starting at, it's hard to tell where they are if they get hurt. Um, so they get a baseline, and right now it's an every two-year protocol, so you get freshman year and junior year. Um, if the kid's had a significant injury and taken a few months, we may re-baseline them anyway before the next sport. Um, Wells is looking at doing that. Right now they do freshman year. They just don't have the person. It's a time-intensive thing to do right. all these kids. It has to be proctored. It's a 30-minute exam for most kids. Sometimes it takes longer. Um, and you have to look at all those tests to see how many of them have invalid tests and retest them. Because some of them will try and gain the system. You know, and they tell each other how to do it. Take your finger and do this, this, and this with the XXO. You know, they, they actually did a study where they had college students and they told them how to cheat and sandbag the test to make them look worse so that they wouldn't look like they'd been injured when they got hurt. Um, and the great thing about impact is they, they've got it so fine-tuned, there's so many hundreds of thousands of baselines to be compared against, um, that it, the thing will tell you, you know, this may be an invalid test. And they try, and the study showed that 90% of the time when they actually knew how to do it, they still couldn't do it. What about your middle schools? It depends, I think, on the school. And again, the amount of time and effort that it takes to do those kids, they're squirrels. Yeah, and then they sit down. Oh God. Would you recommend seventh grade? Seventh, if they're going to be doing football, um, soccer is also a higher sport, both boys and girls. It's the highest risk sport for girls, is soccer. Um, cheerleading. That's some of the most catastrophic injuries out there. And try to convince a cheerleader, especially a flyer, that they can't go back. Oh, but my, my class, they, oh, my team, it, the drama. Um, you have to prove it to them. So those, if you have to be selective, those are the ones to go for. But ideally, I, one of the worst concussions I've ever seen was tennis. Right between the eyes of a tennis ball at the, at the net, she went off, threw up, came back, finished the match. Mm. And it took her six months, and she had to take a leave of absence from school. So, and it doesn't have to be safe. sports. I mean, if we're... I mean, it's time and it's money, but if we're going to test kids, I mean, I'd love for us to just get a baseline of everybody, of the kids in the community. You know, even if it's at seventh grade or ninth grade or whatever, ideally, certainly, 
before sports, but then try and get the other kids in because kids get concussions even if they're not playing sports. And they might not have to do the return to play, but the kids who like whack their head on the refrigerator or whatever, you know, and I don't know how much time you have to do, Barb, you know, to do this and, you know, how much Linda does. Well, last, but year we, last year we started, we did the seventh graders. Right. Dan went into the schools and did them. That was the first time we had done them. You know, and I mean, I'd do the training and I would volunteer time, but mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. I think as a community, if we could get it more broad based, it'd be a good thing. Good luck with the parents who don't have, who don't have the best of interest in that. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so maybe we have it offered, at oh, least yeah. offered to all students, yeah. and, you know. And, and the let big them thing know. is to emphasize how widespread it's done. It's required by NASCAR. They all have to do baseline testing, and if they're in a crash, they have to test, or they don't go out. It, that's just what it is. The NFL, there's no options. A modified version of this is used by the military. Every single person gets tested, and if they deploy, they get tested again, and there's a modified version on the field that the medics use to try and identify somebody who's injured. And then when they come back from their deployment, they're tested again, because they're very good at hiding the symptoms. They don't want to. They don't want to leave their budgets. So, emphasizing that to parents who may not be an organized sport kind of person, um, that this could keep your kid from having long-term problems. You know, skateboarding. Oh God. Okay. Uh, my name is Robin Wade, and I'm a kidney doctor and a kidney cranial therapy. And I'm sitting here, and, and I'm somewhat appalled by <laughs> some of the things um, people would say. But um, uh, I have worked with training cycle therapy since 1985, mm -hmm. and I have had great success with people with concussions. We've been checked out by their doctor first, mm -hmm. and then we refer back to the yep. Had a car accident, they can't see straight, they have a dizzy. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the cranium, the old wives' tale that we learned years ago that when a child is well and that the cranium comes together in the back of the head, there's just one solid rock. It's not. It has articulating joints. Each one of the bones of the head are moving with the impulse of cerebral spinal fluid and it's expanding and contracting very minutely, 6 to 12 cycles a minute. And you get a concussion like that and you jam those joints and they can be freed up. And uh, I think that it wasn't until 1999 the Gray's Anatomy was changed and it says that the bones of the head have articulating joints. And so a lot of people with medical school before then, you know, uh -huh. were, were taught something else. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to update that. Yeah. I would be willing to be part of a, like a trial. Yeah. Maybe 10% of your students uh, uh, intervene with some cranial therapy and get them back uh, to uh, you know pre-existing condition, able to learn it. And I'm not sure. sure I'm not sure if you've seen it again. I know some of the Dr. Garish's practice. Yeah, and yeah. yeah I see kids too. I've had, I've had the report from the kids on that. Too, yeah. But yeah, that, that would be something. Yeah. 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 Those are two big ones. 
uh, kids who have migraine history, who then have an exacerbation or an uptick in their number of migraines and severity, those kids have a while coming back. Um, that too is mediated by blood flow. So if, you, if they are already kind of in a happy place and then you mess with that, their symptoms get worse and it takes so much longer for those kids to get back. I mean, those headaches are debilitating. Um, they, once it gets ramped up, they can't see with the lights, they're in a dark room, they get the ringing in the ears, and it's just it's a vicious cycle. Um, so those kids definitely take longer. Um, when we talked about testing vision, um, and it seems to be more common, I would say in the under 15 group, um, is that their ability to focus, you know how you hold something up and, and you get it to where it's a happy place to read? Some of those kids, their eyes are off. Um, what's called the near point conversion. You bring it in, okay, that's where I see double. It should be six centimeters or less. I see kids with it way out here. They can't read, they can't focus. Walking's a problem. When you think about it, you're, if the floor isn't quite right, and all of that extra brain work to try and just get through what you need to do makes the symptoms worse. And some of them need to have special glasses for a certain amount of time. It's called prison glasses. Um, so all those little, those little things that cause them to not be able to function just makes it longer. But the dizziness, the migraine symptoms, um, those seem to be the big ones. You, know, you would think somebody got knocked out, they were out cold for a minute, has no influence whatsoever. It's almost like it shut down and protected itself. And I always had migraines growing up, but then when I did get hit multiple times, the migraines, for my senior year, they actually didn't let me play until my migraines succeeded. So I think it was not until January that I could play basketball. So it was the same thing. And I'm pre this knowledge. What's the um, education for coaches? In the state of Maine, the law requires that they do the online coaches education every two years. And I think prints out of things saying you complete it. It's about half an hour. I encourage everybody, it's designed for everyday people. You know, if you're the volunteer soccer coach for this, you know, seven and eight year olds, you should be educating yourself and being able to identify it because it's just like a first responder. A kid's bleeding, you gotta know what to do if they're bleeding. You know, you think kid broke something, you need to know what to do with that. Same thing with concussion. Just recognizing the symptoms to pull the kid out. So if you go to the CDC website, cdc.gov backslash concussion. There's a coach's training that's designed for everybody. And then there's also a healthcare professional. It's about an hour. And it, it goes over the highlights. So, you know, if your primary care person <coughs> or your middle level is not familiar with the signs and symptoms, then just tell them, hey, there's, you know, this educational program, online patient hour, you get free continuing education. Um, and that's always good. So, you know, information's out there. It's just, it's a very fluid thing. New stuff comes up every year. So Question I, on that? You yeah. said every two years? I believe that's what the recommendation was, every two years. Now we're watch a video, a concussion video once, once. You did once, once a year? Just yeah. one time. Just one time? Yeah. Is that getting get modified? <laughs> it doesn't. I sit on the board and it doesn't come either. Oh, so that keeps getting updated. They're very aggressive you about keeping that updated. See, yeah. Yeah. But for the concussion, you've got to watch the video once before you can coach. It's a 30-minute video, questions and stuff. Yeah, they should double-check with the, the MPA about that. That's, yeah, I sit on that. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. What would you say to the students who underreport? Um, I don't, I'm not going to tell Mr. Viber that I uh, have hey, Well, if they, choose, if they choose to do that, you really have no way of sussing it out. Um, a lot of times it doesn't show up in the classroom. They sleep all the time. Their head's constantly down. I need to go to the nurse. I have a headache over and over and over again. Um, they just don't look good. You know, we have a kid in class and you get to know them, you kind of see those little changes. Um, I did a teacher education program for Wells, their entire school system. And at the end, I had a, a teacher in the seventh grade go, you know, I have this kid's doing X, Y, Z, he 
he played on the combined hockey team with the folks at Marshwood because Wells didn't have a program. Oh my God, do you think he got hurt? Took him to the nurse's office, she ran through the whole list, kid had everything, and was hiding it. Either out of ignorance, because he didn't know, and was just trying to suck it up and get through it, or he didn't want to miss the championship game. So it's hard to tell one way or the other. The great thing about impact, like I said, sometimes they'll tell you, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and confess everything to the computer. But we can see by those scores if a kid's been injured. Because um, the really good study that showed that kid brains are different than adult brains for concussion came from Mickey Collins, who actually did a study with a bunch of high schools in South Portland. It was in 99. And they literally tested every single football player, I think it was six different high schools. And the athletic trainers, with every kid they even thought had a head injury, tested them on the field with the whole numbers and counting backwards and all that good stuff, pulled them out if they felt that they had a concussion, tested them day one, and tested them day five, uh, seven. And even for the kids who did not have any symptoms, they had scores that were still messed up. And that's what showed that you can be completely symptom free and still be cognitively impaired. And that's different than adults, because for most adults, the symptoms and the brain function kind of go together. But for kids, there's a disconnect. And it catches them lying, because then when you really dig into it, well, yeah, you know, I can't get to sleep, and my little brother's bugging me, and I haven't been able to do my homework for two weeks, you can, you can really call them out on it. One thing I do with kids like who have a concussion is like when I go to make a copy of all the paperwork and an impact test you know, for them to take home, I have them watch this little five minute video. It's like on ESPN um, channel or whatever, ESPN Life After Concussion. And it's about a young boy who got second impact syndrome because he you know, either didn't know he had a concussion, he got hit again, and he's severely disabled because of it. But I feel like that, you know, that when they see that kid, what he goes through, that makes an impact on them. Like, ooh, I, you know, I can't go. I don't want to go back to play too soon. But I find that helpful. Well, unless um, anyone wants to publicly ask questions, our panelists will remain here for, until 7:30. Or if anyone would like to talk to any of them privately, they're here to answer your questions. Please take a snack with you when you leave and some information. And um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.